Thank you for joining and welcome to another consultation and discussion with the lessons from the accountability mechanism stakeholders of the Asian Development Bank. This consultation forms part of the stakeholder engagement that supports the safeguard policy review and update process or the SPRU, as you may hear us refer to it as. It's nice to see so many colleagues joining us and showing interest in the accountability mechanisms issue uh, from across North America and Europe and a warm welcome uh, and again to new colleagues and those joining for the first time, a very good afternoon or evening to you all. My name is Azim Manji. I'm your consultation moderator for this session. This is our 10th thematic consultation topic or theme so far. And this is the third in a series of consultations and discussions of five on the accountability mechanism specifically. In today's consultation, we're joined not only by Director Bruce Dunn of the uh, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department in the ADB, but also by Warren Evans, the Special Project Facilitator in the Office of the Special Project Facilitator, or OSPF. We're also joined by Ms. Aliza Bebet Gozun, the Chair of the Compliance Review Panel, or CRP. We have today at least 28 registrations, 98 of you are from outside the ADB system. And as I mentioned, this is the third of five consultation session, sessions on accountability mechanisms. We have today um, stakeholders and CSOs and other non-governmental uh, organizations and interests from across North America and Europe. 14 are from North America and the EU, and will be joined by five participants from other countries, including Bangladesh, Georgia, Indonesia, Japan, and the Philippines, where it's very late. In this consultation, the Office of the Special Project Facilitator, or OSPS, or OSPF, and the Compliance Review Panel, or the CRP of the ADB, will present the main feedback issues received and the relationship of these comments and feedback and relevance to the safeguards policy update. From the presentations, we're hoping that participants like your yourselves will uh, share insights on the potential gaps of the provisions and implementation of the 2009 policy and propose recommendations to ensure the strengthening of the forthcoming or future revised policy. Comments received from this consultation and thereafter will inform the revision of the ADB safeguards policy. So let me just reiterate that we're not here to talk about the functions of the OSPF or the CRP. We're here to look at how those two agencies or bodies influence and directly um, can provide input into the forthcoming ADB safeguards policy. Before I call upon our speakers, here's a few gentle reminders. Um, as all stakeholders and participants have consented when joining, the ADB is recording this session for the purposes of preparing a summary of the meeting. It is the intention that these recordings will be available to ADB staff and consultants, and then more broadly, to all members of this consultation publicly. If you have any concerns about this, please contact the Secretariat at the email address posted in this chat box, and I'd like to request Jude to please flash that email address in the chat box now. Please also join from a quiet, distraction-free area and turn off your microphone when you're not speaking. During the Q&A session, when Iram invites you to do so, you may ask questions by typing them into the chat box or raising your hand. You will, then ask be, you will then be asked to unmute and turn on your camera so that you can ask your question live. And of course, as we're all colleagues here, please, just a gentle reminder, let's be respectful to everyone and allow us and Iram to manage your time so that we can keep within the schedule. IT support is being provided throughout this consultation. If you experience any difficulties, you may ask for IT support by raising your query or typing it into the chat box. As we're all joining by Zoom, here's a few important uh, guidance notes and buttons to make you aware of uh, the various functions we have available. We ask that you use your proper name in Zoom for our documentation. To change your name on Zoom, although many of you will have already known how to do this, please click on the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. On the right-hand side of your screen, look for your own name. As you hover above your own name, uh, click on the More button on the right side of your name, 
and then click on the rename button. When you've clicked on the rename button, you can type in your name, the agency you represent, and then click OK. If you wish to send a message, question, or feedback, click the chat button. The chat button is on uh, the lower part of your screen at the right hand side. If you wish to comment or raise a question live in English, uh, click on the smile or the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then click on raise hand. To speak and unmute yourself, click on the microphone icon when Iram requests you to do so. And then to show your video, click on the video icon. We value diverse and informed feedback from our wide range of stakeholders, so please allow me to restate ADB's commitment to meaningful consultations. We encourage all consultations to articulate your inputs and concerns during this consultation. These, as I mentioned, will be recorded and documented and subsequently distributed during and for each event. This allows the ADB to review, consider, and respond to, if necessary, any comments and inputs made. Once again, if you wish to opt out of the recording and or distribution of the recordings, please contact the Secretariat through the email address on the right hand side of the screen in the chat box. All types of feedbacks are welcome, of course, and these will not be used for the purposes of retaliation, abuse, or any other kind of discrimination. If you have any issues or concerns on recording, confidentiality, potential risks, abuse, or any other kind of discrimination during the course of these consultations, please get in touch with the SPRU Secretariat through the email address that Jude has put in the chat box. In this consultation, we have about two hours, and here's what we have planned to maximize both your time as well as the ADBs. First, we'll be handing over to Director Bruce Dunn for his welcome remarks, and Bruce, Mr. Dunn will also set the context and set the stage for the discussions that will ensue. Secondly, Mr. Warren Evans, the Special Project Facilitator in the Office of the Special Project Facilitator, will share the main issues and findings of the nature and context of the complaints received by that office. Thirdly, we will have Elisa Bebet Gozun, the Chair of the Compliance Review Panel, or the CRP, who will elaborate on these, as well as ex explain the differences and the functions of the Office of the Special Project Facilitator and how those differ from the Compliance Review Panel. After these three orators, uh, we have, um, of course, Bruce followed by Warren and then Babette, we'll have a brief five minute break. Following this break, we'll have a moderated discussion as facilitated by Ms. Iram Asan. Iram is an advisor who works in the Office of the Compliance Review Panel. This will be a Q&A session that runs for as long as necessary for up to about 75 minutes, allowing stakeholders like yourselves to ask questions and share experiences. You can do this again, uh, just as a reminder, by tapping them into the chat box or raising your hand as previously, previously explained in the Zoom functions. Aram will prompt us all with guide questions to frame the conversation. We'll then return uh, for a quick event evaluation before turning you back to Mr. Bruce Dunn to give us a wrap up and indicative next steps following the consultation. And as such, and without any further ado, I'd like to call upon the director, Mr. Bruce Dunn, for his welcome remarks. Mr. Dunn, if you please. Thank you very much, Suzanne, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, this consultation session today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, see that many of you are actually uh, joining this session um, and have joined many of the other consultation sessions for the Safeguard Policy Update. So very pleased to be back here with you today. Uh, we've got a fairly small group, I see. Um, we've actually done already in the last uh, couple of days uh, two other sessions with uh, civil society organisations and other non-government organisations on this same topic on lessons learned from ADB's accountability mechanism. Uh, so it's you know, good to, to continue the conversation with you today. Um, because many of you are actually joining and, and have joined previous sessions, I won't go into so much detail in terms of the, you know, the background on the policy update, because I think that's uh, very well understood. 
but um, let me just go into a little bit of background on the topic today. Um, of course, we see that the lessons learned from ADB's accountability mechanism is actually one of the, the more critical sessions that we're going to be having as part of these uh, regional consultations for the policy update. Um, cases that come through our accountability mechanism tend to represent some of the most uh, challenging projects and challenging project contexts and um, situations where um, perhaps everything hasn't quite gone as, as to planned and there are concerns and complaints from affected people. So those projects, of course, are ones where we need to reflect on uh, very seriously in terms of um, existing implementation with our current policy. Uh, but there are, of course, um, a lot of rich lessons that can guide us in terms of the development of the new policy. So it's a, a pretty important session uh, that we're having today. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with ADB's accountability mechanism, let me just uh, say a few words there. Uh, it was first established in 2003 and then updated in 2012. And it's designed to provide an independent, transparent and responsive forum for people that are affected by ADB assisted projects and allows them to voice their concerns. The mechanism helps ensure compliance with ADB's operational policies and procedures, and that includes safeguards and, and most importantly safeguards. Um, and it really looks across the, the whole project cycle from the design, processing and implementation of the projects. As you'll hear later, uh, there are two functions of the mechanism. One is a uh, problem solving function led by the uh, special project facilitator. And we have um, Warren Evans here today who serves in that role. And we also have a compliance review function, uh, which is implemented by an independent compliance review panel. And we have the chair of the panel, uh, Babette Gozon. Uh, so we're lucky to have them here today, and uh, this is a good opportunity for them to be able to share their experiences. And it's something that um, ADB has actually been um, working comprehensively on capturing lessons. In fact, every uh, three years, there is a, a joint learning report from our accountability mechanism. The last one was published in early 2019. This is put together by the two officers of the accountability mechanism, along with ADB's independent evaluation department and the sustainable development and climate change department, which is where uh, the safeguards division that I represent sits. And we jointly collaborate on learning reports. And um, the, the, the last one was quite useful. We looked a lot at the, um, the, the genesis of, of why we receive complaints, and, and you'll hear more about that today. Uh, plus, the officers of the accountability mechanism produce their own independent lessons learned reports, and you can find many of these on ADB's website. Uh, so today, you'll be hearing uh, from Warren and Bavette about uh, you know, some of the key lessons and, and what this means. And of course, we're looking forward then to discussing those issues with you. And I know, you know, looking at the um, participants that, that are registered today, uh, many of you have been involved um, supporting affected people on the ground, sometimes involved in uh, preparing or supporting affected people to prepare uh, submissions to ADB or, or perhaps to other uh, independent panels with um, other development agencies. So I think there's a lot of rich experiences and uh, we are very much looking forward to, to hearing those. Um, as Azim also said in the beginning of the session, we, we are focusing on the update of the safeguard policy. And um, just, just to frame it, we're hoping that we can focus um, a lot of the, the discussion and, and recommendations that you have around the strength, strengthening of the policy. Um, I appreciate though that you may have questions also uh, about the functioning of the accountability mechanism and perhaps also some recommendations for how the mechanism uh, can be strengthened. And, and we're certainly happy uh, to, to hear some of those and, and to put those into context with the safeguard policy. Um, however, I wanna note that um, ADB is not yet um, embarking on a process to update the accountability mechanism. Uh, this is something that we see as uh, potentially being launched 
after the safeguard policy has been updated so that that context can then provide a, a framing for issues that we may need to consider with the accountability mechanism. So um, just to give that perspective today that um, we, we'll be angling recommendations towards the update of the safeguard policy first. Uh, so again, look, thank you so much for joining today and uh, looking forward to the discussions. Let me now pass over to Warren Evans, who's going to um, kick off a presentation on the accountability mechanism and also share a short video with you. Over to you, Warren. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. And uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, good evening, our time, morning for most of you or midday. Uh, so if, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we're going to show a short video first which kind of summarizes the accountability mechanism policy. And then I will follow up on a focus on the, uh, on the, the special project facilitator role uh, and Babette will follow with uh, a, a more detailed dis description of what the uh, compliance review panel does. So please run the video, thanks. The Asian Development Bank is dedicated to reduce poverty in Asia and the Pacific and promote social and economic development through loans, grants, technical assistance, and equity investments. Through its products and services, ADB expects to contribute significantly to sustainable and inclusive development in Asia and the Pacific. As such, ADB works to ensure compliance with ADB's operational policies and procedures during the design, processing, and implementation of ADB-assisted projects. These policies provide social and environmental safeguards against involuntary resettlement, environmental degradation, and such other adverse effects that may be the unintended results of development projects. ADB strives to ensure that the projects it finances will not result in any direct and material harm to people. Audit, supervision, quality control, and evaluation systems are employed to prevent and address most issues that occur in planning and implementation. However, despite all preventive measures, there are instances where complaints may be raised by people affected by a project. To address these concerns, a project-level grievance redress mechanism is in place on all ADB-assisted projects as the primary venue by which complainants may seek relief. Complaints may also be brought to the attention of ADB's operations departments, which address concerns through problem-solving and compliance efforts. In addition, ADB instituted an accountability mechanism with a compliance review function as a platform of last resort to seek redress. ADB's accountability mechanism provides an independent, transparent, and responsive forum by which project-affected people may seek redress when directly and materially harmed or likely to be harmed by an ADB-assisted project. ADB's accountability mechanism has two functions, problem solving and compliance review. Problem solving, conducted by the special project facilitator, uses non-formal, flexible, and consensus-based approaches to resolve a complaint. In contrast, a compliance review may be requested only when the probable cause of harm can be attributed to non-compliance by ADB with its operational policies and procedures. The alleged non-compliance by ADB is investigated by the Compliance Review Panel, a fact-finding body on behalf of the ADB Board of Directors. A compliance review does not investigate a borrowing country and its executing or implementing agencies or a private sector client. Rather, Compliance review is a corrective measure aimed to address issues that may ensue from non-compliance with ADB's operational policies and procedures in ADB-assisted projects. With the active participation of all stakeholders, the accountability mechanism becomes an instrument to institute improvements, 
within ADB systems from lessons learned in the compliance review to enable ADB to work more effectively towards sustainable and inclusive development. Thank you. Uh, so I, I want to uh, just point out three kind of unique uh, or semi-unique features of, of the accountability mechanism at ADB uh, before we go on. First is that, that we are different in that I uh, report to the president. My office is part of the office of the president, um, whereas Babette and the Compliance Review Panel, the Office of the Compliance Review Panel reports to the board. Um, in almost ev every other uh, MDB, both functions report to the board. Uh, so we're somewhat different in that, that uh, regard. Uh, the second is that for us, the, it's up to the complainants, very much up to the complainants to determine whether or not they want uh, compliance review or problem solving under the Office of Project, uh, Special Project Facilitator. So the, if they, they choose uh, OSPF, if they choose problem solving, then if they're not satisfied, they can request to uh, move to compliance review. If a complainant uh, chooses compliance review, they do not have the option of coming back to problem solving. Uh, so that's an important uh, distinction, which, which our, our uh, complaint receiving officer that was mentioned in the video does make very clear to the complainants. Uh, the third is that the problem solving process really focuses on a very limited, very limited attention to the issues that are raised by the complainants that are found eligible for, uh, for our problem solving process. Whereas if a complaint comes in for compliance review and the compliance review process leads to other areas of is uh, other issues or other geographic areas of a project, then they will look into that as part of the compliance review. And Babette will talk more about that later on. Uh, so I just wanted to, to highlight those issues as we go forward. Uh, so what are the main issues of complaints that we receive? Uh, number one by far is inadequate uh, compensation or inappropriate resettlement issues. That's the number one issue that, that uh, raises complaints. In virtually every complaint we, re we receive, uh, there is an element of, of issues regarding inadequate consultation, inadequate information disclosure, everyone. Uh, on, on most complaints that relate to environmental issues, it, they are noise and vibration issues. And a lot of times this has to do with uh, infrastructure projects, uh, particularly linear infrastructure projects like roads and so on. And it, and it may be construction related or it may be implementation related or both. And then finally, we many of the complaints that we receive are related to uh, at least secondarily to inadequate baseline studies. So not enough information on socioeconomics, not enough information on potential environmental impacts and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, we have we have had a fairly dramatic increase in complaints over the last few years, and and we think we think we know why this is the case. Uh, we don't know for sure; it's hard to to uh, confirm. But but part of it is that there is a higher level of awareness of project affected people on their option to come to the accountability mechanism. Uh, with complaints and and a lot a lot of that has to do with the support that they receive from uh, from uh, CSOs at the local, national, and international level. Uh, secondly, 
there has been a, a fairly dramatic increase in the number of infrastructure projects that generate the kinds of, of impacts that do generate complaints um, over the last few years. And, and so those are under, under implementation now. And so we are, uh, I think, experience, uh, experiencing some increases as a result of that. And finally, uh, you know, the, the, the complaints that we receive uh, from very remote areas without the help of CSOs um, are a result of increased access to uh, information. And, uh, you know, everybody has access to uh, most have access to the internet, they have cell phones, they do know how to figure out how to uh, file a complaint. And so we receive a number of complaints uh, from people in rural areas that, that don't have support from CSOs, but they, they do their own search and they figure out that they can file a complaint uh, to ADB through, uh, through the, the web. Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, one, one really important point, which is um, uh, always uh, a, a, an important uh, element of our discussion, is that we have a number of complaints that are not eligible, uh, whether they come to my office or to Babette's office. Um, they're not eligible because they haven't met the criteria set by the 2012 Accountability Mechanism Policy that Complainants must make a good faith effort to address issues through the uh, through the relevant uh, uh, operational department, whether it's the regional department or the private sector department. Uh, this is something we don't have much of an option on, though. Though there are cases where we where we do decide to find uh, complaints eligible. Um, because of special circumstances, even though they may not have uh, attempted to address the issues through the, through the, um, uh, the relevant uh, operational department. But uh, in most cases, we do find them ineligible if they have not. But what we do is we agree with the operational department and the complainants on two things. Number one is who do they need to talk to in the operational department? And usually this is somebody in our, our country office um, to explain what their concerns are and help them to, to address those issues. And number two, um, we have an agreement with the operational department on what they will do, what the actions they will take to try and address the issues with, the, with their their uh, executing agency counterpart. Um, and then we monitor uh, the implementation of that. And of course, all of the complainants understand that they can come back to us with their complaint and request reconsideration of eligibility if they are not satisfied with the efforts to resolve the issues by the operational department. Next slide, please. So over the years, we have great, gained a, a lot of experience. And uh, um, from the OSPF side, we have focused very much on the, uh, whether or not the, the actual GRM, uh, the grievance redress mechanism is working. So next slide, please. Some lessons. Number one. Consultation, consultation, consultation. Uh, the, the inadequacy of consultation with effective people, understanding who they are and then, and then consulting with them uh, is the number one issue that will reduce the number of complaints that come on ADB projects. This is very clear. Uh, it's, it's been demonstrated over and over again. Um, Second, the, we do believe that there's an important uh, delegation issue that, that the more you can delegate authority to handle certain issues that are very, very local, 
uh, to the very local, whether it's a contractor or a local government, um, that if you can delegate the, the, the authority to resolve those issues at the local level, then it will be much more effective. Uh, third is that uh, related to number one, is that we really need to improve the uh, social mobilization using community liaison experts, uh, building up better expertise in GRM uh, uh, staff and so on, that, that we generate a much higher level of awareness by project of, uh, effective people on what their options are, on how they, how they approach a GRM, how they, how they can raise their issues and follow up on their issues. And then finally, you know, our communications are, are you know, manual sounds rather bureaucratic, but, but processes on how they can indeed engage in addressing their issues are critical. Next slide. Uh, one of the interesting conclusions of some of the case studies that we've done, and, and we basically what we do is on every case we have, at the end of that, when we get closure on that case, we do a case study to understand what worked, what didn't work, and so on. In some instances, the local government process of dealing with complaints from local communities whether it's water supply or drainage or you know electricity, whatever it is, they work very well. If they work very well, then we should use those rather than designing a, a new grievance redress mechanism for that project. If they don't work, then we need to design a new process for the for the project. But we need to first attempt to integrate the local grievance redress institutions into the project TRM design. Uh, second, uh, we need a much better process of, of at, in, in every instance, of making sure that there's a formal process of registering complaints and tracking them. And in some cases, this is extremely loose. Uh, and uh, while it may work for some, communities, it doesn't for others, and there's no track record of seeing how well it works. Uh, training is, is absolutely critical. Um, in relation to that is building up a, a case base for training staff, um, and we hope that, that some of the work that we're doing on case studies will, will, do, will achieve that. Uh, you know, at, like anything else, uh, if there's no budget, then um, you know, it's not likely to work very well. So it's extremely critical for ADB to make sure that there is a budget when they, when they approve a project to make sure that a GRM is budgeted, that, uh, that staff can be trained and that uh, the, the process can work. Uh, and then finally, and this, this is really something that is a, uh, that, that's being discussed um, uh, continuously right now is how do we make sure that, that if a project is closed uh, from the ADB point of view and issues come up after the project is closed or the budget is spent, how do we make sure that there is funding for actual uh, funding of the actions that are identified as necessary to address the issues of affected people. And that, that's an ongoing debate. And I think that's something that uh, uh, Bruce will want to talk about uh, in, in terms of, of the discussions on the, the, um, the continuing discussions on the new safeguard policy. Next slide. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to Babette, who will uh, talk about the, the compliance review process. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. Welcome, everyone, and a good day to you all. Uh, before I proceed to discuss the lessons from the compliance review, 
I just want to expound on what the Warren mentioned earlier in terms of our work. We're also triggered, the compliance review is also triggered by complaints from affected people, at least two, or their representative. Uh, that, but the difference is that it's not just that the, they are adversely affected by the ADB project, but that that harm or likely harm is due to ADB's non-compliance with its own policies and procedures. Now, when we do the compliance review, we of course start off from the issues that are raised in the complaint itself. However, we are not limited by that alone. If in the process of the investigation, we find things that are very glaring, you know, that could impact the people or the environment, then we could also include those in our compliance review. We definitely do not go out there fishing, looking for issues, but if something is very glaring, then we are we can include them. And uh, so, uh, and then if there are there is uh, there are findings of non-compliance, then management is then asked to prepare the remedial action plan, which we monitor to bring the project back to compliance. So, from the many cases that we've handled, these are the key lessons that we've learned. First is the important of importance of a comprehensive baseline data. We know that this will inform project planning, design, and all the way down to monitoring of the effectiveness of the mitigative measures that have been identified. What we want to highlight is the importance of having comprehensive pre-project baseline data on the socioeconomic conditions of the affected communities. This will allow us to determine the impact of the project on them and down the line actually be able to say if indeed the affected persons, the communities are better off because of the project or at the very least are not worse off. The second lesson has to do with due diligence. Next, please. Due diligence, which the bank does when it assesses a project to be funded by ADB, uh, should definitely include the assessment of the capacity of the borrower to actually implement the ADB safeguards policies. Uh, and we've seen how this is the only way we can actually ensure that uh, the policy itself will be implemented. We've seen this uh, in some of the cases that we've handled in one case in Cambodia, it required the resettlement of over 3,500 people, yet the one in charge of the resettlement was a newly organized commission composed of three non-technical people. We also saw this in the case of a project in Sri Lanka, which was the uh, Greenfield. It was the first time that the Roads Development Authority was going to implement a 26-kilometer expressway the limited capacity of that agency was actually identified early on, but then no interventions were introduced, included, integrated in the project itself. So if there are capacity limitations, the appropriate measures to build that capacity must be integrated in the project. At the same time, of course, uh, the gaps between the ADB safeguard and the following countries legal and institutional framework should also be assessed. Uh, lastly, the, the possible uh, participation of the affected persons themselves uh, should, should be uh, explored and promoted, not just in terms of the designing the project, but all the way to implementation and monitoring. The third key lesson is on allocation of resources. There must be adequate resources on safeguard implementation, monitoring, and all the way to the corrective actions that are needed. This includes the allocation, the designation of the appropriately skilled technical staff for safeguards who should be part of the project from the very beginning. And resources should be not just front-loaded during design and processing, but should carry, be, that should be there all throughout the project cycle itself. And to maximize the use of these resources, safeguards resources, of course, it's important to do things right from the very start to avoid unnecessary costs later on. And one way of ensuring that is to have precisely the appropriate technical skilled people on safeguards from the beginning. 
as well as having more sustainable capacity building measures. The fourth key lesson has to do with constructive and meaningful participation of all the stakeholders, including the affected persons themselves. We cannot expect to have meaningful consultation and participation without the proper, proper identification of the affected persons themselves. We saw this in the case of a, a project in India where the fisher folks were missed, and also in a project in Georgia where the visually impaired were missed. Proper identification of affected persons will allow us to identify the impacts on them, the different, because we, we know that projects have differentiated impacts on different people, and also then integrate their concerns into the project itself. For us to say that there's meaningful participation, there must be a continuous flow of information all throughout the project cycle, not just a one-way flow of information, but a back and forth flow of information. And we've seen that with inputs, in fact, from affected persons themselves, project design and benefits can actually be enhanced. In one, one case that we handled, we saw that inputs from the stakeholder consultations allow the project to actually avoid, uh, to reroute a road, to avoid some more that would be affected, some more uh, re residents that would be affected. And in terms of benefits, in the case of Georgia, the visually impaired actually uh, gave some suggestions, which led to the installation of traffic lights with audible signals, uh, clearer markings of pedestrians, and installation of speed control measures which benefited not just themselves, but also others. And while the policy provides for the minimum standards for meaningful consultations, there's actually room to customize this based on the actual project needs. Now, the last uh, lesson that we'd like to highlight is that compliance review must be framed, must be looked at as an instrument to actually improve ADB's development effectiveness. Uh, after all, we are implementing the accountability mechanism of uh, the bank. We may be independent, but we are not isolated. And the purpose of having the accountability mechanism in the first place is actually to contribute to improving ADB's development effectiveness. So instead of focusing on the investigation, what should be promoted are the objectives of the compliance review improving the design and implementation of projects and also building institutional capacity. Lastly, we wanna promote and actually do compliance review as a collaborative endeavor among all the different project partners. Ourselves, ADB management, the borrower, the complainant, other, other members of the communities and the NGOs so that we can optimize project outcomes. Thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, the discussion, a fruitful discussion with all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Warren and Babette, for providing us with clarity and feedback and the processes of the Compliance Review Panel and the Office of the Special Project Facilitator, uh, as well as the differences between uh, what Warren's office does and what Babette's office does. Um, and also thank you to Bruce Dunn for framing and contextualizing the discussion. We hope that we can get further feedback from you on what ADB should consider in these general policy topics and areas during the facilitated Q&A session, which will run for up to 75 minutes. Um, with that, please allow me to invite you to take a brief break for about five minutes. But before we take that break, as with previous sessions, while you're in the break, please kindly think about how we can improve the level of discourse and engagement in these consultations. If you have specific uh, options or areas or um, uh, recommendations on how the engagement can be improved, please feel free to share those on the mentee.com link that's um, in the chat box now. But with that, uh, as the countdown timer reaches zero, you'll know that it's time to return to your screens. And as the music begins to fade, that'll also be an indication as you're walking to your fridge or your kettle or whatever it may be to return to the, to the screen because we're about to start. 
And when we do start, uh, the Q&A session will be moderated by Iram Hassan, who works with the Office of the Compliance Review Panel. So see you in about five minutes, and thank you so much for uh, staying with us so far.
Welcome back. And uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Aram Hassan, who works with the Office of the Compliance Review Panel. And just a reminder that this Q&A session will run for about 75 minutes um, or less, as the need may be. Uh, you may ask questions and share experiences, as I mentioned previously, in the chat box or through raising your hand, as previously explained in the Zoom functions. And Iram will also prompt you with some guide questions to frame the conversation. So with that, let me turn it over to Ms. Iram Asan. Iram? Thank you very much, Azim. Um, and uh, welcome everyone on, you know, from my side as well. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, just a quick reminder, before we start the discussion, the purpose of uh, this consultation is to learn from each other and mainly for us to learn uh, from you all and from gain um, uh, you know benefit of your wisdom and your experience. Um, also, I just wanted to I know that you've heard from the respective chairs of both accountability mechanism offices, um, but just to uh, bring it uh, bring the conversation back to the actual topic, which is the safeguards policy statements update. So I would really appreciate if today's discussion can be focused on what best can be done in the new and upcoming policy vis-a-vis -vis the accountability mechanisms of uh, the bank. So relating to accountability, but focus on um, SPS. I open the floor with this. You can raise your hand, write a question in the chat box, introduce your name and institution when you ask a question. Um, any question? I see very, very um, interesting uh, organizations that have joined us tonight, and uh, I'm really, really expecting a fruitful discussion. Who's going to break the ice? Or should I, ah, I was about to use my biology teacher's tactic by giving a cold call, but Megan saved the day. Hi, Megan, please. Hi, hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, hi, I, I wanted to defer um, to see if anyone um, had um, direct case experience that they wanted to share. But um, hi everyone, I'm Megan Pearson. I'm a policy fellow at Accountability Council. Um, we support communities who experience harmful social and environmental impacts from internationally financed projects to seek accountability and redress. And we advocate for strengthening independent accountability mechanisms at multilateral development banks. Um, so just um, to kind of give a roadmap of just a few recommendations that I would like to touch on, um, the safeguards um, need to be informed by experiences of, of people who are most affected by unintentional negative impacts of ADB financed projects. Um, they also need to enshrine remedy in a way that is consistent with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, as a matter of transparency, the safeguard should require ADB clients and sub-clients to disclose the existence of the CRP and OSPF to project affected communities. Um, the safeguard should also require ADB management staff and clients to engage in good faith with the accountability mechanism. Um, and then um, looking forward to the, um, the um, revision of the um, accountability mechanism um, policy itself, um, that of course will need to be updated to, um, to be coherent with the new um, safeguards when those come out. Um, so just to touch on the first point that a ADB safeguards need to be informed by the experiences of project affected people. Um, I just want to thank you so much for convening this session. It's really, really important that the safeguards be taking lessons from the accountability mechanisms cases. Um, on this point, I just wanted to share some bird's eye level data from the accountability console, um, which as many of you know, is a database that tracks every complaint ever filed at an independent accountability mechanism, um, just to enforce some of the great data that um, Warren Evans had shared. Um, so ADB's accountability mechanism, um, and this is both functions um, total together, has received 208 complaints. Um, and the vast majority of those complaints are coming from infrastructure projects, um, with energy being the next highest. 
Um, but of course, all types of projects can cause harm. And we're also seeing complaints from other sectors as well, including regulatory development, agribusiness and education. The top issues raised are displacement, consultation and disclosure and livelihoods issues. Um, but just to zoom in a bit and to take lessons specifically from adverse impacts from poor or no compliance with the 2009 safeguards, we can look specifically at complaints about projects where non-compliance has been found. So of those projects, most were infrastructure, but there were also a couple of energy projects and one conservation and environmental protection project. Um, the issues that were raised in those complaints where non-compliance was found were community health and safety, displacement, consultation and disclosure, livelihoods, environmental issues, due diligence, and pollution. So these instances of non-compliance tell us that at minimum, the safeguards around those areas really need to be strengthened and enforced. And a good place to start would be to ensure that human rights standards are being incorporated throughout the ADB's environmental and social policies. Um, the next point I wanted to mention is remedy. Um, the safeguards should enshrine a remedial environment consistent with the UNGPs. Ensuring that complainants are made whole if they are harmed is a key part of improving ADB's development effectiveness. Um, it can't simply stop at ensuring compliance with bank policies. Complainants also need to be made whole. Um, the ADB needs to establish reserve funds for remediation of adverse impacts should any arise. And those funds could take the form of bonds, an escrow account or performance funds for high risk projects or clients. Um, the United Nations just this week has released a report recognizing that lack of remedy is a systemic issue at all multilateral development banks. Um, just to share some recommendations from that report that are relevant to the safeguards policies, the policy needs to require contingency planning for remedy and that environmental and social action plans should include provisions on remedy, including beyond the resettlement context. Um, mitigation hierarchies need to be amended in order to incorporate a clear requirement that adverse impacts, including adverse human rights impacts, need to be remedied. Um, we need to ensure that human rights impacts are not subject to offsetting. Um, they need to provide a broader range of reparations, including restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition, rather than only compensation and offsetting. And they also need to ensure that the technical or feasible or financial feasibility criterion doesn't trump human rights considerations. Um, the safeguards policy needs to specify that IAMs should seek to address and remedy harms in addition to and related to the environmental and social performance of DFIs. Um, on a more specific level, um, we're seeing that communities who bring complaints to the ADB's accountability mechanism are not getting remedy through that process. Um, of the 208 complaints that have been filed total, only 33 complaints have been found eligible. Um, that's 16%. Um, and so 79% of all complaints received close without outputs um, so even if the mechanism exists, very few project affected communities are actually getting remedy through it. Um, and I understand that there are other methods for um, communities to be um, getting their complaints addressed, but this is specifically um, from the accountability mechanism itself. Um, on the subject of transparency, um, I've, I've raised this recommendation, I think, in, in previous um, sessions, but just wanted to reiterate that the ADB should include in the safeguards policy um, and in contractual agreements, a requirement for clients and subclients to disclose the availability of the accountability mechanism to project affected people. This is a relatively quick and easy step that ADB could take to ensure that communities know the ADB's mechanism is available to them. Um, Fourth, the safeguards should require ADB clients um, and, and staff as well to engage in good faith with the accountability mechanism process. We've seen across multilateral development banks that there are often not clear procedures for how bank management should be engaging with the mechanism. Um, and so just keeping in mind um, the future um, revision of the, of, of the mechanism policy, making sure that the safeguards are um, being clear and explicit about what management's role is going to be in engaging with the mechanism and ensuring that its functions are being carried out effectively. Um, and then just on a final note, um, looking forward to the, the update of the AM procedures themselves, um, 
the AM is only hearing and addressing a very small fraction of the complaints that it receives, um, which can not only inhibit communities from getting remedy, but it's also can be a missed opportunity for ADB to learn valuable lessons from the cases where its financing has unfortunately led to harm. So we're looking forward to continuing to engage with ADB during that upcoming process. Um, thank you. Wow. Thank you, Megan. That was um, brilliant. Um, if you have not already done, may I request, before I pass on to Bruce, of course, uh, to respond and to comment, may I request you to send us these thoughts uh, over email in writing as well, while I tried my best to write, <laughs> but, but at one point in time, I, I kind of uh, yeah, lost track. Um, because these, these are very serious issues and you've summarized a lot whole of issues very, very succinctly. So please do send us these comments in writing. That will be really, really helpful for us. Over to you, Bruce, for your reaction to what Megan has just shared with us. Well, thanks very much, uh, Iram, and, and thanks very much, Megan. That was a, a really great set. Actually, it um, provides a pretty good framing for, I think, a number of topics that we may cover and come back to during the course of um, this session. Um, I was also furiously writing down uh, points, so it certainly would be appreciated to, to share those. Um, let's try and pick up on a few of these. I'll, I'll maybe pick out a few. I think there's also some ones that um, my colleagues from the accountability mechanism, uh, Warren and Babette, um, would certainly want to uh, refer to as well. Um, so let me, let me try and run through a few of them, maybe fairly briefly initially, so that we've got space to, to also um, come back to points with you or to hear from other colleagues. Um, firstly, on, on the experience of um, the project affected people, um, they're useful to hear the, the data um, that you've compiled there, and it's very consistent I think, with the data uh, that, that we have and uh, the review of lessons learned in terms of the um, uh, the types of projects, sectors, and the reasons uh, for the the types of um, either grievances or non-compliance issues that we're that we're seeing, um, and certainly many of them do have a genesis in issues like uh, you know lack of baseline, uh, adequate baseline assessments, uh, meaningful consultation, effective grievance address mechanisms, as well as some of the um, you know more technical issues um, that that you raise, such as related to health and safety or um, uh, resettlement processes, compensation, livelihoods, etc. Um, so these are issues that um, need to be dealt with uh, through a range of uh, of means. Um, Firstly, in terms of the, the approach that we're taking for the, for the policy update, um, we certainly need to make sure that we've got a clear um, policy structure and set of requirements around these issues. Um, for example, on, on the um, stakeholder engagement and meaningful consultation, we see a, a lot of scope to strengthen this in terms of the existing policy and implementation side. Uh, also grievance redress mechanisms. Um, you know, the functionality of those has certainly been challenging. And, and this is something that, um, you know, I think uh, Warren in particular with his work on problem solving is seeing. Um, so a lot of work to do, you know, in, in that space and getting the policy and implementation framework um, in, in place. Uh, on uh, remedy, I, I think this um, certainly, this is an important area. Um, the, the recent paper from uh, United Nations and the session that was held on that just a few nights ago is certainly very important to, to this update process. Um, we have you know, quite a, a lot to do in that space in terms of uh, supporting and enabling remedy throughout the process. A uh, few kind of, you know, maybe some brief points initially just to mention there and, and things that we can unpack and explore a little bit more. Um, you know, certainly, you know, first and fo foremost, uh, prevention is, is better than cure. And, and this also relates to some of the comments that you were making around the mitigation hierarchy. Uh, we do need to strengthen the um, environmental and social safeguards policy. Um, we need to make sure that uh, the potential environmental and social impacts and risks and the stakeholder concerns uh, are being fully, or perhaps we can say, uh, better assessed and managed throughout the project cycle. Um, you know, heading off issues before they lead to a stage where, where you need to enact remedies. So 
that uh, approach in the safeguards and the mitigation hierarchy does certainly need to be um, looked at. Um, also agree with you in terms of, um, you know, offsetting um, so social impacts. I think that's a very different area. The um, construct of the mitigation hierarchy, I think, you know, has largely come in through the um, environmental impact assessment process and, um, you know, offsetting things like, uh, you know, an impact to, to a habitat through restoration is one thing, but, uh, you know, offsetting social impacts or human rights issues is, a, is another. So that's certainly an issue to, to look at more. Um, another aspect in terms of setting us up in this approach is around the risk assessments and management. Um, and one thing that we're seeing uh, we need to give more scope to in, in this policy update process is around uh, integrating the, the contextual risks, uh, things like uh, fragility, conflict and violence, as well as the um, client capacity, track record, uh, commitment. And, and this needs to be brought much more into the, the project uh, screening, design, management process. Um, and there's a lot that we can we can gain by having closer uh, collaboration with um, the United Nations agencies, uh, civil society organizations, um, with data and dialogue uh, to strengthen those contextual risk analysis um, and the preparation of projects. You know, for example, uh, using uh, United Nations human rights bodies um, or the ILO uh, to, to help us understand concerns over non-compliance with human rights issues and, and to bring that um, where relevant into a project context. Um, another aspect there, of course, grievance redress mechanisms um, and, and the independent accountability mechanisms themselves. Um, I won't say more on that now, but, but that's incredibly important area for us to, uh, to discuss more um, in this session today. Um, enhancing our monitoring and supervision, including the use of third party monitors. So, so these are all aspects that, um, you know, we need to, to, to strengthen in terms of the, the policy framework um, so that we're set up uh, better in terms of avoiding uh, and managing impacts. But then you, you quite rightly turn to um, you know, the, the, the legal and financial responsibilities. And, and I think this is an area where uh, we are looking uh, more and, and we'll be looking more in the, um, the context of the, the new policy rollout, uh, the construction of the project legal agreements to, to ensure continuing legal and financial responsibility um, for the project to meet all of the uh, environmental and social measures. And, um, Things like contingent financing, security or performance bonds that you mentioned as well uh, are certainly areas um, that are being used in, in some industries, um, security bonds, for example, um, and certainly something that um, we can and, and ensure more. Uh, the procurement process also um, incredibly important there. And, um, you know, we need to make sure that um, you, you've got contractors um, that have got the right capacities um, and then you can use sort of carrot and stick mechanisms um, to encourage uh, good performance but also uh, to, to penalize poor performance um, you know so these types of approaches in terms of um, looking at, at the whole sort of continuum um, of, of enabling remedy across the entire project cycle to the end to ensure it uh, it is certainly a critical issue. So um, that, that's just a few thoughts in, in terms of response there, but um, obviously a lot more that we can discuss uh, during, during the session there. Um, disclosure on the um, compliance uh, review panel or the accountability mechanism. Uh, certainly, yes, maybe my colleagues um, from the accountability mechanism might like to speak a little bit more about mm -hmm. some things that we're doing uh, there. Um, they may also like to come in a bit more on um, what happens with some of the complaints that are not found eligible, because um, they, they certainly don't end um, with the accountability mechanism if they're not found eligible. Um, they're in fact turned back 
to the operations departments to deal with them and, and that process is tracked. I, I'm sure Warren and Babette might like to say a little bit um, more on that process. Um, and then lastly, in terms of revision of the accountability mechanism policy. So yeah, we, we're expecting that uh, following the update of the safeguard policy and then reflecting on, on changes that would be made in that context, um, that some revisions to the mechanism will, will need to be considered. There'll be new areas in the policy, for example, around uh, labour or integration of climate change and other, other aspects um, and, and, and the policy implementation structure itself. So I think that will all need to be reflected on. Um, but let me pass to um, Warren and Babette because I, I think they um, add some value in coming in on some of these points. So thanks again, Megan. There's, there's a lot to unpack from, from your points. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Babette. Yeah, uh, thanks, Megan, and thanks, Bruce. Yeah, uh, I want to touch on two things. Uh, first is uh, what you raise about uh, disclosing uh, to communities the availability of the accountability mechanism. Uh, this is actually something that the two offices address with management also. And uh, we are now in the process of working with Bruce and the legal team of uh, ADB, uh, actually finalizing a, a provision uh, which will, we hope will be included in the loan covenant, which will require the borrowers to actually inform communities to be affected by the project about the existence of the accountability mechanism and that they can avail of this venue to raise any issues that they may have. In addition to that, what we've also done is to uh, activate the focal persons for every resident mission on accountability, on the accountability mechanism. So we have AM focals that have been designated by their country directors. And uh, among the TOR, uh, the scope of work that they're supposed to do is, act, is, is to help us uh, raise awareness about the accountability mechanism. So just as the project is being packaged and uh, we know where it's going to be, uh, just as they inform the communities about the project, they should also be informing them about the existence and the availability of the accountability mechanism and the two functions that they can avail of. Uh, on the issue of eligibility, uh, as uh, Bruce already mentioned, just because we don't find them eligible does not mean it ends there. Uh, and as uh, Warren mentioned earlier, uh, most of the reason why we find them ineligible is because uh, majority of the time it's because uh, they have not uh, exerted good faith efforts to try and resolve it uh, at the project level and also with the ADB management. As uh, presently formulated, the accountability mechanism is the last resort. So those other venues should first uh, be resorted to before they can come up to us. And uh, so if they have not done that and there's still opportunity to address their concerns at the management level, we turn it over to management. And But it doesn't mean we, we then forget about them. Uh, we do ask the operations department to submit reports to us on what, the, what happens to those uh, complaints that they're handling. And probably for more detail, over to you, Warren. No, I, I, I think you, you covered it very well, Babette. Uh, I agree. I, just, I was just going to say I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bruce, uh, Babette, Warren, and Megan once again. Thank you. Um, it was a lot to take in, Megan, uh, but I hope uh, that we have uh, kind of uh, given you some responses and some uh, reactions. I see, um, but, but please feel free to add anything else uh, when you send us these written comments, Megan. We will really be looking forward to receiving them. Um, Mark, Mark Pasquel, you've raised your hand. Please introduce your organization and ask your question. Over to you. Yes. Hi. Thanks, Irum. Um, I'm Mark Pasquale. Um, I work as a finance campaigner for Recourse. Um, among other things, we track and monitor development finance flows as a means to um, influence the wider investment community to ensure inclusive, um, environmentally sustainable, socially, socially just, and pro-poor development. And I'd, I'd first like to thank, um, thank you for this um, opportunity to participate in this consultation on the ADB's 
um, accountability mechanism in the context of the SPS review, which we believe is quite um, important, especially at the time where there's even higher demand for um, transparency and accountability and an overall push for development banks to align with the Paris Agreement. I just wanted to pick up on one of the points raised by Megan um, regarding the need for greater transparency uh, with particular attention on financial intermediary lending transactions of the ADB, which has been particularly um, challenging because of the longer chain of operations from investor to the user end of the project and ultimately to affected communities. In, in cases like these, civil society organizations find it difficult to operate on its watchdog function and hold the ADB accountable simply because of the lack of access to information regarding sub-projects financed by the ADB and the hands of nature of these kinds of um, investments. I, I recall earlier, Bibeth mentioned that, that one of the lessons identified by the, the review was the need for um, constructive and, and meaningful participation of project stakeholders, but without properly disclosing sub-projects supported by the ADB, the bank is um, effectively denying opportunity for affected persons to complain and ultimately to access justice through the ADB's GRM. So in this context, I, I wanted to raise a few recommendations, which I believe have already been raised um, in other fora, things that we would like to see um, included in the SPS review of the ADB's accountability mechanism. First is that the ADB should require time-bound disclosure of project information in advance of approval in line with best practices. Second, um, ADB must ensure disclosure of the name, sector, and location of higher risk sub-projects financed via FIs, and this must be accessible via the ADB's website and on the FI client's uh, website as well. Third, we also urge the ADB to disclose its involvement in sub-projects at the project sites, ensuring that it is clearly visible and um, understandable to affected communities. And similarly, as Megan has already mentioned, we believe the ADB should ensure um, information um, about the accountability mechanism is disclosed at project sites, including how affected communities can contact the mechanism and access the GRM, as well as um, supervise clients' adherence to, to this requirement. And uh, just as a last point, I wanted to ask how and whether the ADB has considered this issue, because I'm pretty sure this has been uh, raised before, and how it intends to um, comply with the need for greater transparency in um, FI lending especially in the context of uh, ensuring um, access to information and justice to affected persons and in, in communities. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Bruce, would you want to go first or should I refer to Bibeth or Warren to come in? Oh, either is okay. I'm happy to come in um, and then pass to Warren and Babette afterwards. Um, sure, go ahead. So firstly, thank you very much, um, Mark, for, for joining from Recourse and um, really appreciated those comments. On the financial intermediary side, um, we're hearing a lot uh, about this through the consultation processes. Um, we are actually preparing some further analysis internally around options for financial intermediary lending. I think the issues that you've identified in terms of, um, you know, timely disclosure, um, information about um, uh, sub-projects and, and their risks and um, other issues, for example, around the um, environmental and social management systems of uh, the financial intermediaries. Um, these types of issues are certainly being raised and, and we're having a look at. Um, we're also doing consultations with um, some of our private sector clients and discussing some of these issues with them as well um, to see how we can, can promote this. Uh, so we need to find a way forward. I think there's definitely some legitimate um, issues here. We're actually planning, uh, I think, towards April uh, to do a separate consultation on this topic. So 
I think by then we'll have a few further perspectives to, to be able to share. A um, co couple of things for, for now. Um, for the high-risk projects, um, they're actually already and fully required um, to, to have disclosure of the meeting, for example, Category A environment um, through financial intermediaries need to be fully disclosed on our website and to meet the 120-day disclosure uh, before they are approved. Um, you may not be seeing those or many of those on our website, however, because we're actually quite risk averse with our portfolio. Um, you would actually see in the majority of the loan agreements with financial intermediaries, um, except in a small number of cases where we've got um, some larger infrastructure financing um, facilities that have had a small selected number of high risk category A projects, the majority of them, the loan agreements actually exclude um, the use of the, the proceeds um, for high risk projects. Um, you do though have then an issue of uh, further disclosure of some of the sub projects and you know recognizing that uh, they can still have some issues that's something that we need to to look at more closely. Uh, for the information disclosure on the availability of the accountability mechanism uh, down to project affected people uh, for those sub investments under financial intermediaries, um, I, I absolutely agree with you that should be available because the mechanism still applies and, and Warren and Babette may want to come in on this, but um, we are looking at the uh, legal agreements. Um, and working with our Office of General Counsel at the moment, as is mentioned, um, around having clear requirements for uh, providing information on the accountability mechanism um, down to affected people are working with ADB to provide that information. Um, and we're looking at language as well in terms of how that could be applied for financial intermediaries. Because uh, obviously you need to cascade that down. Our legal agreement is with the financial intermediary, but then they'll be making, of course, agreements for further sub borrowers. So, so it's that you know cascading um, effect that needs to be worked through. Um, but, but certainly something we're aware of and and uh, you know keen to look at more. Um, Warren, over that, any of these points you'd like to come in further? Um, not, not for me. No, thanks. Okay, I think I think Bruce, you've uh, yeah, you've touched upon uh, most of uh, Mark's uh, um, questions and comments here. Uh, unless Mark, you want to come back and follow up on anything that Bruce has just mentioned. No, no further questions at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much for Thanks, Mark. It. Yeah, um, yeah. Don't see any more hands. Um, how can we, uh, let me see. Vince, do you want to go ahead and ask the question here? I see it in the chat room. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Vince McElhinney. I work for Conservation International and uh, echoing everybody else's um, thanks for having this opportunity to talk about um, the, um, the bank's experience with grievance mechanisms and to contribute to the policy review. Um, th this is a question that comes up a lot and in terms of our work and, as, and, and other policy reviews that we participated in. And it's, it's recognized as a lesson learned in terms of both um, resource allocation for safeguard capacity on uh, presumably the project teams themselves and the uh, implementing agencies as well as the sort of budget for um, project level grievance mechanisms, whether it's a contingency fund or um, awareness raising or all the other things that are needed to make a, a grievance mechanism work. Uh, I wondered if you could say anything more about, it. it's, it's really difficult to dig into this lesson unless we have some reference for what the baseline is and, and what the gap is. Uh, and I don't know if you've done any further work to begin to think about what, what is the gap. And if so, if you could characterize it for us, that would be, um, that would be helpful. 
Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Vince. Um, and before I pass on to Bruce, just wanted to apologize that I'm on first name basis because I really do not want to butcher anybody's last name by mispronouncing them. So I'm sticking to what I see on the screen. Um, so please, uh, apologies for that. I did not mean any, uh, do not mean any disrespect. Bruce, would you want to come in to respond to Wins's comment? Um, yeah, thank you very much, Vince, and, and nice to see you again. Thank you for joining um, from previous consultations. Um, okay, so firstly, how to characterize the, the gap? I think there's several aspects here. Um, one are capacity gaps, and, and this is something that we see, you know, consistently. For example, reading also your comments in the chat, um, project level grievance redress mechanisms. Um, they often don't function well and effectively, one, because they're not uh, designed or, or customized to the, to the local context and culture or to the uh, nature of the affected people or the, um, you know, unique vulnerabilities that may exist um, and the certain context that they have to operate in. Um, and that often contributes to them not being, you know, accessible or functioning correctly. Um, there's capacity gaps in terms of um, the staffing within them. Uh, there's gaps sometimes in the institutional arrangements in, in that um, they, they may be operated um, by a contractor or parts of them with a contractor or parts of them with a project management office, but they need to link in to other um, arms, um, say, for example, government agencies that d deal with land acquisition and, and those institutional arrangements may not be set up well. So, you know, there's a whole range of aspects to do with capacity and, um, you know, it's, it, it's hard to sort of characterise that gap, um, except for sort of going through the, the issues and how to address that. Um, th there's a range of things. We want to provide better guidance uh, around um, how to strengthen the functionality of, of grievance redress mechanisms and make them much more context specific. Uh, we need to make sure that they're well resourced um, in terms of having trained people and with finances to actually operate them properly and, and that needs to be budgeted for. Uh, it's hard to put an exact figure on that because it will depend on, on the project. Um, the, the other types of gaps that, that we've got are certainly um, you know, financial resources available for um, the environmental and social safeguards, um, uh, you know, across, across the board. Um, this is something that, um, of course, you need a, a good planning process to look at the resources that are needed to, to implement a project, and that goes into environmental management plans and monitoring plans. Um, but there's one critical gap that, that we're trying to look at more through the procurement side in that you've got contractors that are you know, primarily doing a lot of the implementation and they need to have um, budget. Um, so you know, based on the bidding documents, the environmental management plans, et cetera, they need to be set in, setting aside the budget, having the human resources with the trained people. So uh, you know, the, the bid criteria, the financial resources. So these, these are all other forms of gaps, which we're trying to look at through the procurement processes. Uh, another is contingent financing um, within projects, which we often uh, do. You'll see you know, fa fairly good contingencies within a project uh, to address the environmental and social safeguards. Uh, and in cases where that may not be sufficient, uh, you'll often see uh, scope changes done to projects to, to be able to address issues. So. I mean, that, that's just trying to generally sort of characterize some of those gaps and, and the ways that we're looking at doing it. I, I don't have sort of specific figures on hands, but I think we, we have a pretty good understanding around where the, the challenge points are. And then there's a range of, of sort of levers that we need to, to pull a bit more consistently and strongly uh, to, to be able to try and close those gaps. Um, again, Warren and Babette from the experiences in the accountability mechanism, you, you might have some thoughts there as well. Uh, well, 
I'll weigh in uh, way beyond uh, the SPF role. Um, Vince, I think I think that that uh, Bruce won't be too upset with me if I say that that ADB has always needed to understand how to partner more effectively with international uh, organizations and, and regional. Um, I think there are so many opportunities that uh, have nothing to do with our safeguard policy or the accountability mechanism uh, that, are, that are directly related to our effectiveness that we need to do a better job. So, so I, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we absolutely need to figure out how to work better together in addition to making things happen on the ground, but also uh, making sure that our, our, our uh, accountability mechanism, uh, our safeguard policies work. So, I, you know, in my view, as as kind of the the old timer on the block, uh, I do believe that that we've got to figure this out, uh, and I think it's great that that CI and and others are online here uh, to have this this discussion because we've got to figure this out. We've got to make this work better in the future, and. Um, you know, I so I'm I'm sorry, Bruce, for raising that, but I I think that that this is a challenge that uh, MDBs in general have not done a great job on, and we do have to make uh, a, a much more concerted effort on how we're going to make uh, our partnerships work with CSOs internationally, nationally, and locally. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Bruce and Warren. Um, Wins, any follow-up on what you raised or any comment? Um, no, no, thanks. I, I realize it's a multi-dimensional sort of um, question, but I appreciate the sort of overview of some, some of where the gap is. And um, if, if anything, maybe to think further down the road, um, and, and this has come up in other policy reviews. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of things um, rely on resources and the incentives to budget correctly as is, is, was kind of inferred in a couple parts of Bruce's comments. Um, it, it's almost, uh, it, it's, it's challenging for outside observers to, um, to key in on that particular issue because we often lack information about um, what are what are the structures for budget um, for the safeguard uh, for the safeguard operations in general at a macro level, and then you know how uh, how is guidance given to budget projects, and uh, where where do those gaps um, materialize in terms of um, the macro to the micro level? And so if there if there is any additional um, information that could be presented down the road, perhaps in the context of developing an implementation plan, uh, we'd, we'd certainly benefit from kind of reflect, reflecting on those um, aspects of implementation. But um, thanks for your answers. Thank you, Vince. Yeah, um, we've made, I've made the note and I'm sure Bruce was writing as well and we will be happy to come back. Bruce, do you want to come in? Yeah, uh, no, just to thank Vince again, um, th they're important issues to think through. I just reflecting a little more. Um, the, I, I've rarely seen in my time at, at ADB over the last 12 years that it's, it's an absolute limitation in finance. That's the issue. Um, th there's usually funding available or funding that can be found for the project. It's the, um, the capacity, the commitment, uh, the ability to um, get the clients to be able to effectively mobilize that, that financing that, that's available and, you know, and commit it. There's sometimes limitations, um, as we see in some of these accountability cases. 
uh, within the governments because of their own legal instruments and uh, we may be requiring additional requirements that go beyond and they've got limitations, uh, maybe concerns about auditing um, and, and paying additional compensation or other mechanisms, but it, it's not necessarily the finance as a limitation itself. We've usually got mechanisms or can do scope changes to projects to add the money, but it's these other elements uh, that enable that. And I think that's one of the spaces where, you know, we as, as, as MBBs need to look at how do we enable these mechanisms? How do we enable the remedy more effectively? Um, that, that's a key issue for us to look at more. And we're happy to continue this discussion because there's it, pretty important elements for us to unpack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, uh, Toshi, you have been very, very patiently waiting from Mekong Watch. Please, over to you. Uh, no problem. Thank you for giving me an opportunity. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. My... Unmute yourself. Sorry. Oh, uh, can you hear me? All right. Okay. Um, Hi everyone, um, my name is... Then we go. Okay, uh, you can hear me, right? Hello? Uh, Toshi, yes, I can hear you. I think there was some echo coming down the line, but yes, we're actually you hearing hear. you very well. Hmm. Okay. Um, go ahead. Well, okay, uh, let me know if I have to repeat or I have to speak slowly or, or whatever. Um, um. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, sorry Toshi, you're very, your voice is very choppy. Maybe you turn off your video for a better connection and let's try then. Sure. Uh, what about, is this any better? Better, better, yes. Okay, okay. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one has to do with, um, is actually a follow-up question on uh, complaints uh, that were uh, judged to be non-eligible. Um, I understand that the accountability mechanism uh, just, you know, doesn't let them go, but do some follow-up work on them, which is which is good. Um, but I, I wonder if you, I mean, the accountability uh, mechanism office ha has any data or statistics to show how many of these uh, uh, non-eligible complaints or complainants actually have contacted uh, the relevant operational department or departments and worked out uh, uh, their concerns and, and problems. Uh, that's my first question. Uh, in other words, more sort of about, you know, data statistics, uh, which allow us to, you know, look into the issue in a more uh, detailed manner. Um, my second question uh, has to do with the first presentation by, by Warren. Uh, and if I heard him correctly, or, or you were incorrectly, I, I think you said something about uh, a project uh, where uh, the project's impacts uh, either remain or, or actually um, emerge after uh, the project is, is closed, as far as the ADB is concerned. And I think I heard you uh, that the um, ADB is trying to do uh, something about, about these cases. Um, and I just would like to, to uh, be informed a bit more about what kind of ideas the ADB is actually developing. Uh, of course, again, I know for a fact that the uh, even a closed project, so to speak, ADB just you know, doesn't let it go. And uh, you, know, you might do a, a, a follow-up study after uh, 10 years or 15 years or, or your independent uh, evaluation department may go back to that project and look into it in, in the future. So I know that the ADB is already doing um, or, or addressing that issue, but um, Warren sounded like uh, the ADB is, or maybe the accountability mechanism office in particular is trying to do something more. So uh, if I'm interpreting you correctly, uh, I, I'd like to uh, hear a bit more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toshi. Loud and clear. Warren, would you want to please come in? Um, I think you can actually take both the questions uh, raised by, by Toshi. Right. So, so on the on the, the first issue, the um, uh, uh, just to be clear, 
when a project is found ineligible, it is uh, uh, addressed directly with the by us with the uh, the operational department that uh, is responsible for that project, and we have an agreement. We reach an agreement uh, with that department on what steps need to be taken to address that project. So it's ineligible because they, the complainant has not yet addressed the issue with the operational department. And that's by policy, it's not eligible. Uh, so we, we have an agreement with the operational department about what needs to be done to address those issues. We monitor those issues. Uh, sorry, we monitor those those uh, actions that address those issues, and and so that's our role. We're we're very much uh, um, kind of off site. We're not central to that action, but we do monitor those those actions, and and we actually have a a regular. Uh, interaction with each operational department on on uh, what they've done to undertake those actions. Uh, so so that I think that will hopefully that answers your first question. Um, I'm not real clear on the second question. It was maybe Aram, you can repeat. Yes. So, uh, so Toshi said that um, um, he uh, he understands that ADB uh, comes back after the project closure, sometimes few years later, through an IED evaluation study, or ADB kind of continues to evaluate few projects even after several years of its closure. Um, but he said that uh, he uh, heard you saying that probably AM uh, accountability mechanism officers also. Um, come back or follow up on closed projects, um, which uh, I thought we can clarify on the monitoring period and how we sometimes exceed monitoring period. Maybe Bibet wants to take it, but for anything on that. No, well, well, yeah, just, I mean, what we do is if a, if, if we uh, have a, a, an eligible or ineligible complaint, um, uh, we do follow that until two years after uh, uh, the closure of the loan. So um, uh, it's, it's uh, in reality, that has not come up very often, I think twice. Um, so uh, we do follow that though. I hope that, yeah, I mean, that it's, it's a bureaucratic process, thanks. Thanks, Warren. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, Warren, I think uh, Yoshi was referring to the last bullet on your presentation uh, about, you know, possible contingency funds, you might, you know, because ah. some of the impacts may happen afterwards, yeah. Okay. So, so thanks. Thanks, Bebet. So, so on that, uh, uh, as Bruce said, we, we do not have a... Uh, Quite frankly, we don't have a consistent policy. Um, so what ADB does right now is that if a on a sovereign loan, if there's an issue that comes up that requires redress um, uh, actions, then we we really apply our our partnership at the country level to try and make sure that there is adequate financing to address the kinds of issues that might come up. That has very little to do often with the finance of the actual project. Uh, with with, with non-sovereign loans, that's much bigger challenge. And um, fortunately, we've had very, very few cases where that has come up. But uh, the reality is that we have uh, uh, our partnership at the country level to rely upon 
for trying to um, make sure that there are uh, resources available regardless of the status of the loan um, at the country level for sovereign operations, but for non-sovereign, that's a different situation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Vivek, do you want to come in? Yeah, no, on uh, in you on your first question, Yoshi, as as explained by Warren and mentioned earlier, uh, just because they're ineligible doesn't mean we lose track of them. And it's not we are not expecting the APs uh, by themselves to then go to the operational department concern. The operational department are supposed to get in touch with those people to discuss their concerns and try to resolve them. Now, on your question, uh, is there a you know central database for this? So that we can actually track. Uh, well, unfortunately, we don't have that for now, but that's one of the things that we have requested management to put together. Maybe Bruce, you want to uh, answer that part of because right now the different operational departments have their own databases, but we'd also like to see it across the board, across all the operational departments. And that's something that uh, there was an agreement with management before that they will put this together. And Bruce, I think, can expound on that. Thank you, Babette, for handing that over. I had my hand up and uh, a couple of points to come on. Um, firstly, thank you very much, uh, Toshi-san. Nice to see you again. Um, on that last point, so all of our operations departments, and, and what we mean by our operations departments are our, um, either our private sector operations department or the departments that work on projects in the different regions. Um, at the moment, all of them have their own tracking systems, uh, which basically um, look at various issues at a project level, including complaints um, and recording those complaints and how they're dealt with. Um, and then we've got a, a corporate mechanism called our um, project portfolio rating system, which includes safeguard indicators within it, in, including uh, issues of complaints to then be able to track and rate projects that have got issues and concerns so that management can be informed of it. Um, but we haven't had a consolidated mechanism across the entire bank to basically bring that information together from the individual departments in a consistent way and, and, and track it. So if, if someone asks me, um, you know, how, how many people have been uh, resettled across the entire bank and how many of those uh, do we have complaints on? I've got to go to each of the individual departments and sort of gather that data manually, which is not effective. Uh, so we are in the process now of um, developing something we're calling uh, the Integrated Safeguard Management System. We've done a conceptual design of it and we have a um, IT company that's doing uh, now the build of the system, and uh, that will allow us to um, bring all that data together centrally and, and track it more consistently. Um, it will have sort of a like a business workflow aspect to it, but also uh, data and analytics, so so that we'll be able to sort of produce some of the data also that you're asking for there. Uh, so that was one thing. Um, second point, I just wanted to come to. Um, you know, I think it's a legitimate issue. Um, you know, if, if a project has closed and it's been closed for two years, but then an issue has been identified, uh, uh, an unidentified impact, but the project's closed. At the moment, the accountability mechanism says that they're not eligible under the accountability mechanism. And, and I'm aware of one case uh, in the last couple of years where that that was the case and uh, yeah i mean that that's really not going to be satisfactory for for project affected people to be able to deal with issues um i think though the practice is and, and warren was sort of speaking to this um that's not something on, on a sort of operational level that we're comfortable with and and there are normally mechanisms to follow through with this you know to go back to the clients and and look through our portfolio and we've certainly had cases where, for example, a project's closed, but we've identified issues where a subsequent project with the same 
executing agency in the same sector, we've actually put conditionality and built that in to the design of that project and into the loan agreements to be able to, to address and, and remedy, if you like, some of those non-compliance issues. Um, so so that, that's kind of a workaround mechanism that we've been using at the moment. But um, it, it's certainly an issue, a legitimate issue to look at with the revision of the accountability mechanism when that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, Boran and Rebet. Toshi san, do you have any follow up uh, or you're okay with the responses you? Yeah, um, just uh, uh, maybe a couple of comments uh, about my uh, second. Well, first of all, um, thank you for your uh, feedback and, and responses. Appreciate them. Um, I raised the second question because uh, I have the experience of working with local communities, particularly those uh, resettled. Uh, uh, not just by ADB uh, funded project, but other uh, uh, de development banks and, and agencies. And oftentimes, local people realize uh, resettlement impacts much later, uh, you know, stages. Um, and of course, you, you, I mean, one could say if local communities do not pass, perceive impacts, maybe there are no impacts. I mean, you know, one could say that, but at the same time, uh, you know, local people sometimes need time to understand what they're, what they're facing. So my question, uh, which was, you know, uh, entertained very well, but uh, it's pretty much based on uh, my ground level experiences. So I just wanted to uh, say that. Um, for, the, for my first question, um, apparently I, I thought, um, an answer would be pretty straightforward. And if the ADB doesn't have, uh, you know, that kind of data or statistics, I thought getting one would be pre pretty straightforward, but apparently you have a very complicated system. And I, the reason I thought it would be, I mean, you know, getting that kind of data would be pretty straightforward is because you already know how many um, complaints uh, were, you know, uh, uh, found ineligible. So I thought it, it would be just a matter of following up on, on these cases, but maybe um, it's uh, much more complicated technically, and maybe, I don't know, in terms of confidentiality even, uh, more difficult than, than um, I imagine. But again, I was uh, curious about that question, partly because of due diligence implications, but also um, it may have implications to the mechanism itself, which of course should be, you know, discussed not here, but elsewhere. Um, and that might enlighten us in terms of actually looking at the, the requirement that, you know, requirement of the complainant, you know, should uh, um, try to work out um, the issue uh, in good faith with the relevant uh, uh, operational department uh, beforehand. Because if I'm not mistaken, um, some, uh, uh, accountability mechanisms, uh, IFC in particular, if I'm not mistaken, again, doesn't have that requirement. Uh, and so I, I think, uh, and I understand that the ADB has its own, you know, reasons for retaining that requirement, but perhaps we can at least discuss whether that requirement is really, you know, crucial or not. And, and to do that, uh, I, I thought that kind of, you know, data might be um, uh, important. But again, I understand that this has more to do with the mechanism itself rather than due diligence. So um, it can be discussed perhaps at later stages elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ushisan. You're you're right. This is this is um, this has been uh, talked about in our other sessions as well with uh, with uh, CSOs from other regions. Um, so yeah, we will definitely uh, take it up, and this is something to consider also in the upcoming uh, uh, AMP update, accountability mechanism policy update. But um, having said that, I think if uh, there is no other question or reaction from Bruce uh, or any. Um, yeah, may maybe just briefly. Oh, it's a really good point again from you, Toshi-san. So um, a couple of reflections. I, I, I do think it's a legitimate question and uh, maybe an evaluation topic to look at in the context of um, a, um, a policy update for the accountability mechanism. Um, 
I'm aware, of course, that other mechanisms don't necessarily have that, uh, the ability to go straight to the accountability mechanism without necessarily um, working through, say, project level grievance redress processes um, it could be an option to consider. Um, so, so I think there is some need for some evaluation evidence in that space. So it's something to look at at a later stage. But um, one, one thing in my mind, we need to enable those quick acting project level mechanisms as, as much as possible. And, and I'm hearing, of course, from, from many of you around, you know, people need to know that those functions are available and then they need to be uh, safe and accessible, or, you know, all of those elements around it. That That's really critical because when we do go up, at, and, and I think you, of course, appreciate the, the time and cost of the accountability mechanism and they're not necessarily quick in responding uh, to affected people's concerns, especially when it goes into compliance review. So it's really enabling those quick mechanisms to help local people address their issues um, as soon as possible. But then, of course, your point, Toshi-san, around um, some of those issues may not uh, be identified until later. Livelihood impacts, for example, which could take many years in some cases to, to become evident. So that, that's certainly a legitimate issue to look at as well. Good, good to discuss more and maybe we can find some forums to, to talk a bit more about some of this. Thank you. Thank you, Toshisan. And um, my colleagues tell me that you've been um, commenting and working um, uh, with us for quite some time. I'm new to this world, so, so good to meet you and good to hear from you. And same goes for everyone else. Thank you very much for joining us for this discussion session. It was really, really fruitful discussion. We learned a lot um, as we went along tonight. Um, uh, and uh, I see uh, my colleague Azim to ready to take over from me to carry on the program. Over to you, Azim. Thank you, everyone, once again. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Warren, Babette, Bruce, um, and others working behind the scene, including Jelson, Pauline, and Jude as well. Uh, but mostly a special thanks, of course, to you, the participants, stakeholders, uh, and attendees here. Uh, without you and your inputs, these uh, types of consultations are um, less, less important and less informative. So you make it happen and worthwhile. Uh, we're grateful for your insights, your comments, the clarity of your questions, the sharing of your experiences, and the constructive feedback. And just to reiterate that the comments on the accountability mechanism we received from this consultation and hereafter will be considered in, in the final inputs into the review and the revision and the updating of the uh, standard and the policy statement. So again, um, very grateful for your contributions. Please don't go yet on your screen as you've seen um, uh, up already. We would request your feedback. There's this brief Zoom poll that's on there and right now you'll see the question, how effective is this consultation and how satisfied are you with the level of engagement and discourse uh, from this consultation? Please rank the consultation on a score of one to five, five being the highest and one being the lowest. And we'd like to wrap that up quickly in the next 30 seconds, uh, if possible. Um, so please give this consultation a ranking of one to five. And then as I mentioned previously on the mentee poll, you can give us some more detailed feedback on how we can uh, improve the level of engagement and discourse uh, and interaction with you, the stakeholders to better inform the SPS process. So uh, that mentee poll will come later. You can complete it any time after this consultation for the next few hours. Um, but right now, if you can give us a score of one to five on the effectiveness of this particular consultation, we'd be grateful. After closing that poll, let's say in the next 10 to 12 seconds, I'll turn over to Mr. Bruce Dunn again to give us his summary of what we've heard, as well as take us through the next steps of uh, the, the process. So um, if we can get your feedback on this particular poll, how would you rate your satisfaction with today's uh, consultation and today's session? Please give the consultation a score between uh, a score of between one and five, so we can move on to Director Bruce Dunn.
Jude or Pauline, if we have the results of that survey, uh, you close it whenever you feel, oh, great. So 100% scored uh, the consultation four or better, which means somewhat satisfied or highly satisfied. Of course, there's obviously room for improvement there with 80% scoring uh, a four, which means somewhat satisfied. So uh, please tell us explicitly how the consultation can be improved in the mentee poll. And while you're thinking of that answer, uh, and the suggestions, please let me turn it over to Mr. Bruce Dunn to give us a summary and the next steps. Bruce, if you please. Great, thank you very much, Zim. And um, thank you so much to everyone that's joined today. It's always really valuable to have your intellectual inputs into this process. It was pretty um, stimulating for, for me, a lot of really um, important topical issues that uh, came up. Um, despite the time of the night over here, I'm, I'm pretty fully awake listening to these issues and trying to think through things. So um, thank you again for that. Um, just to, for time, I'd to try and make a sort of a quick summary of, of some of the key issues, but we will make, be making a more detailed summary of the session uh, for the documentation. Um, maybe broadly, I can break up the discussion tonight, we, we had a whole range of issues around the role um, and the functioning of the accountability mechanism. Um, some clarifications, of course, around how the mechanism does function, um, but also some recommendations. Um, a few key points just to pull out there. Um, one, I think there's general agreement that the scope of the accountability mechanism policy will need to be um, reviewed following the update of the um, the environmental and social safeguards policy. It obviously needs to remain fit for purpose. Um, secondly, a um, number of you have mentioned around the need for transparent information disclosure and awareness raising for project affected people uh, around the um, availability of the accountability mechanism. But of course, they need to know who is financing it and that. AEB's accountability mechanism is, is available. Uh, that's something that we're working on and, and certainly an area that needs to um, be, be strengthened, including um, we heard about uh, some of the challenges and issues with financial intermediaries. And of course, with the um, uh, more arms length of um, final investees, with that, that, there's additional work to be done there. Um, we had quite a bit of discussion around uh, processes for dealing with and tracking ineligible complaints, what happens to those, and, and we've heard about how they are handed back to the operations departments in cases where those good faith efforts um, have not been made, um, and, and discussed how that's tracked, and um, also some recommendations for uh, evaluating that process further and having some statistics. Um, it's a good recommendation. Um, we had some points raised around um, the cutoff period for the mechanism. It's currently within the 2012 accountability mechanism policy. Um, complainants can bring forward issues to the accountability mechanism uh, up to two years after the project has uh, technically and financially closed. Um, and questions around whether that is adequate and cases where um, issues may be identified after that period. Um, for example, livelihood impacts, uh, resettlement impacts may not be identified for some time period. Uh, so that's certainly something to, to consider. Uh, also the whole monitoring process associated with that. So there's a range of issues there around the accountability mechanism and obviously we need the, the safeguard policy and the accountability mechanism to, to work hand in hand together because it is part of the, the whole process and, and links into remedy as well. Uh, then there was a range of issues around, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, uh, update of the uh, safeguard policy, number of things that we need to be looking at in terms of, I think, um, Greater, greater clarity and depth within the existing policy, sorry, within the new policy, but also the implementation arrangements. And uh, just to touch on a few issues, things like uh, strengthening the uh, screening and risk assessments, um, including contextual risk analysis, um, which would also have in some scope around human rights issues. Um, this context is extremely important for 
um, guiding further assessment work for uh, <clears throat> the preparation of the project design itself. Uh, excuse me a moment. Uh, another issue is around strengthening the baseline assessments. Obviously, if that's not done well, uh, the scope of the project's not going to be appropriately designed. Stakeholder engagement, meaningful consultation, you know, time and time again, uh, we're, we're hearing and understanding that, um, you know, the, the genesis of many of the impacts uh, or complaints that we receive are to do with um, some deficiencies in those processes um, or, of course, with the functioning of grievance redress mechanisms. And there's a lot of uh, scope to improve the, the functioning of GRMs and, and the capacity there. Um, also, some good points made around uh, the need to enable remedy and the work that's happening uh, there around that topic and recommendations, for example, coming out of the, um, uh, the UN, um, had some discussion around some of the approaches there in terms of um, you know, finance, contingent finance, uh, security bonds, but, but there's a whole range of um, aspects that need to be considered there to, to enable remedy overall. Um, and, and one additional point to mention there that came up was around um, reframing the mitigation hierarchy in the context of remedy. Um, so I, I think we've covered the majority of points there. Apologies if I've not uh, covered everything or I've missed some critical points, but we will certainly be reviewing uh, this in detail. Uh, and then also to let you know, we'll be running further consultations on a range of topics uh, through to about May. We've made some adjustments to the schedule and uh, we're revisiting some just in terms of making sure we're ready and we've got some of the background analysis done for the consultations. We'll then be going into a process of um, more country consultations uh, with our developing member countries and with us also uh, local civil society. And we're planning some project affected people consultations. So they'll be happening uh, up through till about August uh, this year. And in parallel, some of that will be working on the early drafting of the policy. And at this stage, we're looking to have um, sort of a first draft available for public consultation starting from around September uh, this year. So lots to do with our team and lots to think about. So I appreciate all of the um, good recommendations and discussions today. Uh, so until the next time that we meet with further consultations, uh, take care and thanks again for joining. Thank you.